leadership in the era of digital shift. CEO Perspective. Hello and welcome to the CNBC TV 18 special. I'm Shireen Bhan and we're in conversation with uh, some of India's and uh, global CEOs to talk about leadership in the era of a digital shift. I mean, we've been spending so much time talking about digital disruption and what that's doing, not just to corporations, but also to entire supply chains. And uh, from not just an operational efficiency point of view, but also how technology is going to be driving choices that CEOs make in the future. To discuss uh, the road ahead, uh, we've got with us, as I pointed out, uh, a great set of panelists here. Chuck Robbins, thanks very much. Uh, welcome back to India, and good to have you back good on CNBC here. TV 18. Rashesh Shah of uh, Edelweiss. Rashesh, thanks very much. KK Maheshwari, uh, thanks very much for joining us here. Vikram Limai and CP Gunani, always a pleasure. Chuck, let me start by asking you, and I'll get my first question in because we've seen a historic mandate for the Modi government. Cisco's been a long-time investor and a committed investor in India. Your aspiration for India uh, when we last spoke was, uh, was Cisco's global revenues being driven by India, uh, and the target is between 5 to 10% in the next few years. Where do things currently stand? And on the back of what you're seeing in India, what does the future look like? We are very excited about what's happening in India. There, it's rare that you get a combination of Great leadership, consistent you know, leadership, uh, all of the elections that we just saw, uh, huge growth opportunity, uh, democracy, mm. and the belief in the power of technology and how important technology is to everything that India is trying to accomplish in the future. And so we believe that uh, this is perhaps the most critical market for us on a global basis right now, outside of obviously the U.S. is always going to be important. But as far as secondary markets, this is our, this is our largest employment base outside mm -hmm. the United States. It's the place where we've made the most investments. And we believe that uh, based on the execution of our teams over the last few years, we continue to see very solid growth. And I think we'll see it for the uh, foreseeable future. You know, speaking of growth, and I was just looking at the IDC data, across the segments that you operate in, in India, it's been a strong growth for Cisco. Uh, and you continue to be in a leadership position, whether it's the routers market and in the networking space in general. Now, given the fact that 5G is going to be the big bet, and that is what the government is also hoping on, and now you have a new government in place, so perhaps the auctions will, will get underway. Uh, what does that opportunity look like, particularly? Well, I think what the most important thing is, is when we look at this inclusive digital growth that we're trying to drive here and around the world, it's important to get access and connectivity at high speeds to every citizen in the country. And some of that work has begun with, some, with the providers that exist here today already. And then 5G gives us an, an opportunity mm -hmm. to extend you know, technology and high speeds out into all parts of the country. And that's, once you get that in, then you can deliver new applications, banking applications, education, healthcare, et cetera, which fundamentally changes the profile of the country. So it's super important. And for us, it's just we're, we're just going to help our customers build out the most robust how network. How confident are the customers feeling about the 5G rollout in India? Well, I think that, uh, look, it, there's, a, there's a huge buildup for a few years about 5G. Everybody's very excited about 5G, and now all of a sudden it's perceived to be here, and now we stare down the complications of getting 5G built, right? <laughs> we, have, we have to deal with the spectrum situations. We have to deal with the business cases. We have to deal with the yeah. capital investment that has to be done. Yeah. We have to make sure that we have the real return on investment put together for our customers and with our customers on how that'll work. So we're in the process of doing that, as opposed to you know two years ago where we were we were hopeful that it would one day get here. Now we're into actually planning mode. CP Gurnani, let me come to you now. Visibility, uh, you know, everyone's talking about having to make the shift to digital. It's no longer uh, an option. You do have to make that shift. But given the sort of geopolitical visibility, given what's happening with Brexit and the US-China situation, I mean, how, how are things looking at this point in time for business? So clearly, India has a very dominant role to play in the global economy. Digital is now business. Yeah. Digital is all pervasive. And uh, the responsibility that all of us in the industry have mm. is, how do we make sure that it is inclusive? How do we make sure that we carry the communities with us? Yeah. It is also important is that we take into account the sustainability initiatives mm. uh, as we go along, because yeah. uh, you know ultimately all problems will get resolved, whether it is the China and uh, uh, you know, U.S. or whether it is the 
UK and Europe. Yeah. Uh, the fact is that the transformational power of digital mm. and 5G is frankly not going to transform so much a consumer. Right. It will give a big impact to the industry. And number two is that the new players will emerge mm. because, you know, as uh, people like Cisco, people like Altio Star, they spend money right. in virtualizing the network. Yeah. I mean, you're no longer dependent on one operating system or a one equipment mm. player. Mm. And uh, the way the industry will benefit out of it, I think those are the real benefits of digital transformation that 5G will bring. But I want to pick up on the interesting point that you made that, you know, uh, uh, since we're talking about leadership in the context of the digital era, um, on, on the responsibility of the CEO and uh, the responsibility of corporations to take communities along. I, I don't know if you've uh, seen this TED talk by the uh, leader of Chobani where he talks about how CEOs mu must not just focus on return on investment, but must also focus on return on kindness. And that the CEO ultimately reports to the consumer. So in that context, in a digital era, how is leadership being redefined? I think uh, if you look at uh, most of us now have started measuring the business on the sustainability indexes. Mm. I mean, uh, somebody saying that uh, kindness officer, somebody will say I'm a chief happiness officer, or somebody will say, you know, I'm the chief entertainment officer. I mean, uh, which, which one so are you? <laughs> which, which one are you? I'd, I'd like oh. to believe that at least. Uh, uh, you know, I would uh, continue to believe that I'm still addressing the three P's. <laughs> the people and the planet and the profit. Okay. Right? So, uh, so my point of view is that all of us in our own way are making that contribution. Right. And frankly, digital only helps us. As you look at your business plan today, and you know, digital is not, is not an option. As Mr. Gunani said, it is, in a sense, driving the business today. What is it that you're keeping in mind when you make those choices? So, you know, it's uh, important to recognize that uh, the National Stock Exchange uh, is effectively a technology business. Okay, so we're about technology and risk management. We have a dual role as a frontline regulator, and then we have a business role in order to make sure that we provide the most efficient platform mm. and that we monitor the markets and make sure that the markets develop in a disciplined way. So I certainly view ourselves as a technology business. Mm. Uh, and at the core of it is you know, cutting edge technology that we have to deploy. It's not a very well known fact, but the National Stock Exchange is in fact the second largest exchange in the world mm. in terms of trading volumes. And we process more than a billion messages a day uh, with indigenous technology that right. we are very proud of, along with high quality partners such as Cisco, which have been our partners for networking equipment and then several other partners on various other fronts. Mm. So I think for us, uh, digital and technology is core in terms of not only how we operate internally, but how yeah. we interface with the external environment. Mm. Because we have to provide the most efficient platform in terms of throughput at the lowest latency. Mm. That's what we're supposed to do. And obviously, regulate the markets and make sure that market development it happens in a disciplined way so that from a long-term perspective, we have uh, trust in markets uh, established and strengthened. Mm -hmm. so, that's, so that, frankly, from a technology perspective, uh, there is a lot to do, not only in terms of um, uh, how we facilitate trading and how yeah. we facilitate market development, yeah. but also regulation, surveillance. There are a whole host of issues. Mm -hmm that uh, technology is key in terms of what we do. So on the to-do list, and you brought up uh, two of those crucial aspects, regulation, surveillance, et cetera. On the to-do list, uh, you know, what are the top five priorities at this point in time, especially as we look at the Indian markets maturing <coughs> even further, as we expect volumes to pick up even further? Uh, and, and from a regulatory perspective, you know, uh, things like data localization and so on and so forth, does that cause any sort of a concern? So you've asked for five. I would say number one, two, and three are market development. Mm. Because I certainly believe that uh, if we don't get market development right over the next couple of years, uh, I don't believe we'll be able to grow at 9 10% growth rates based on the way we are architectured today with over-dependence on bank financing. We have to have alternate sources of capital. We have to facilitate uh, more capital raising in the primary markets, more liquidity in the secondary markets, et cetera. So market development has to be priority mm. for everyone. 
and obviously we sit in the middle of all of it in terms of facilitating that with um, the government and with regulators. So that is certainly a very important priority for us. Uh, the two other things I would mention is are more internal. So one is certainly a digital transformation, not because we're not uh, digital today, but yeah. you know this is an ongoing initiative, and, and you know we have to be a new age organization. We have to look at how we are future ready. Mm. There's been an evolution of technology over the last decade that we have to take advantage of, and so we have to be future ready. And uh, as an organization, I think it's the right time for us to once again think about where we are and where we want to be over the next 10, 15 years. Mm. So digital transformation and cultural transformation are the two, uh, the two other elements of the five point agenda. <laughs> Leadership in the era of digital shift, CEO perspective. Leadership in the era of digital shift, CEO perspective. Rashesha, you know, from an industry perspective for the financial services sector, uh, you know, how crucial is this shift and, and what does it mean now over the next five to 10 years specifically from the Indian perspective? You know, everyone has spoken so much about the opportunity, uh, unlocking of India's digital economy and what that could mean in terms of the multiplier impact on the GDP. But specifically for the financial services sector, how do you see this playing out? True, it's actually, uh, I think, one of the most important agenda items for the next, not just five, 10 years, I think for the next 20 years. Because as you see, uh, you know, in India and actually all over the world, a lot of financial services was about capital and people. Mm. And now everybody is convinced that it is capital, people, and technology. Because as you see, India, you know, we have a lot of uh, household savings. Uh, India saves a lot. And we have a huge amount of investment required. And any financial service, whether it's a stock exchange, whether it's a, you know, asset management yeah. firm, insurance firm, you sit in the middle in what is called intermediation. Mm. And India historically has been very expensive intermediation country. Yeah from converting savings into investment. I think with technology, we are now seeing opportunities to really bring that cost down. Mm -hmm. and, and we have done that in other parts. Like, it, you, know, yeah. data, you know, India data cost is low. Right. With UPI, now we are you know, bringing down transfer right. costs. So slowly and steadily, technology is going to bring intermediation costs down significantly. And it's actually very good for India because India is at the stage of development where maybe, you know, China was 25 years ago, other mm. Asian countries were 40 mm. years ago, US was 80 years ago. But fortunately for us, the cost of development because of technology is the lowest it is now. Right. So we will get our development done at a, in a very low cost effective manner and get it done a lot faster. Mm -hmm. And it applies in financial services as much. So, you know, 10 years ago it was, you know, uh, the business would decide something and technology would implement it. Yeah. Now, now business technology, and technology yeah. is the same. Yeah. It's not an outsourcing absolutely. arm of business. It is business now. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. That convergence is absolutely essential and necessary. Mr. Maheshwari, give us a sense of what's happening in, uh, you know, across the sort of not new age businesses and, and how the traditional businesses are making the shift to a digital era. Let me just put it in perspective that even the so-called new age businesses, uh, which claim to have no assets, <laughs> no other technology businesses like Airbnb or Uber, yeah. fundamentally there's always a physical product or service which is there behind it. Right. What the technology platform is allowing them to do mm. is to render that service far more cost effectively and with speed. And I think it's the same we in brick and mortar business tend yeah. to own the assets instead of using others' assets. And it provides the same opportunity of making a fantastic use of those mm. assets mm. in a much more cost-effective manner. Also, the biggest change, I mean, again, we are also leveraging that, maybe not as effectively as the Airbnb guys might have done, is reaching out to your customers far more effectively. Yeah. Let me give you an example. You know, ours is a very unique business wherein every time I have to search for a new customer because people build house mm. once in a lifetime, maybe mm. twice. So in India, we have, let's say, typically about 10 million target customers, of mm. whom about 2 million odd come to us. Now, how do I, and they have a lot of anxiety, first time work being done in their life, yeah. will I complete, get the quality work done, will it get completed in time, will I get it in the cost? All those host of anxieties, and we have traditionally been very effective of rendering technical services. And we have a large number of people going onto the field and explaining it to people, mm. giving them that comfort and confidence. Now, with technology, we've been able to put out like 
baad ghar ki videos right which very subtly explain to them at each stage of construction it's not like one said all if yeah. you want to one yeah. in, in one go everything or at each stage what are the problems he is likely to encounter right and how can he overcome them mm. so now this opens up a area of our cooperating with a large number of customers at one go effectively mm -hmm. we have got out now on our platform like we can help him do a complete costing okay we are now thinking of how do we take it to an advanced level where maybe we can even tell him how he can play around with the you know uh, way he is going to construct his okay. house for now or for future so okay. these are all opportunities which are being leveraged by us both for customer external fa facing and again in our business i think very many people may not know for example we moved up, last year we moved over 70 million tons hmm. we had over 3 million truck movements 10000 railway rakes movement and a thousand ship movement just to reach this out to our customers now i have 50 plants spread all over the country yeah. 75000 dealer retailers in 30000 location you can imagine the complexity Absolutely. in terms of network optimization and making sure that in real time i'm able to service all the customers effectively yeah And, and there again you know all this digitization technology is helping us is is is, uh, is i think key. this is now where uh, i think the technology is becoming a core yeah in the sense that how can we reach our customers more effectively and also improve our internal processes to become Absol far more efficient absolutely chuck let me ask you for a company like yours and you know cisco has been a serial purchaser uh, you've gone out and done m and a year after year to acquire capabilities that you may not necessarily have had as you look out at 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 the field today what is it that excites you from from an m and a perspective and a technology perspective yeah, you know i think that uh First of all, our teams have done an incredible job over the last few years of really increasing the innovation cycle inside the company. If you look at our growth last quarter, we grew 6% and yeah. it was 40 40 basis points came from acquisitions, the rest was organic new innovation that our teams built, which, you know, I'm really proud of. Um however, we still look for those strategic, you know, assets that either give us more capability in markets that we mm. already exist in, think cybersecurity, anything that we can bring into that space. Uh, or help get us into adjacent markets that are close and and you know complemented by what we do today so app dynamics that we bought a couple of years ago was a bit was a great example of that and uh so we look at all those opportunities as well as we look at deep partnerships like those that we built with Apple and Google and mm. you know uh, Amazon Microsoft etc uh, so do you believe that deepening these collaborations is going to be an imperative Uh, aspect that CEOs will have to focus on for the future. I do. I think that uh, look, technology is moving so fast, and it's it's amazing to hear my colleagues who are in different industries talking about the importance of technology, and they're speaking about technology. That's the good way, news for you, isn't it? Well, they're, they're saying what I was saying two years ago. You know, they're like, uh, and so the reality is is that our customers need us to move faster than we are today, and. they need us to move and help them create business outcomes mm. right not and in order to deliver business outcomes that might require us to partner more deeply with uh, an industrial player that you may have in your logistics process that you just mm. described yeah it might bring us together and bring our tech and their mm. knowledge and mm. some of their industrial tech together to get the right solution for the customer and so i think these partnerships are going to be essential i think any any one tech company who thinks they can deliver everything to the customer is going going to fail. It's just mm. not it's not feasible in today's world. Mm. It's moving so, too fast. So, so let me start by getting wrap up comments and I'll ask uh, you Mr. Gurnani to kick things off. Uh, so the job of a CEO as we make this shift into the digital truly digital uh, era in a line. People people people. I mean as long as you can focus on people I mean uh, I know there is an answer. Uh, Vikram Limai uh, you know what what are you going to summarize that as trust 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 mm -hmm. and the reason i say that and this this is a broader point not only in terms of what we ought to be doing and what we focus on as an organization but i think in the broader environment i think there needs to be greater trust and more collaboration all around uh it needs to be less adversarial whether it's government regulators the private sector we want growth and development rashesh sir i think uh, 
as we look at Indian economy, as we look at Indian corporations going forward, I think technology is going to have such a fundamental impact that I think we're all underestimating it, maybe. Uh, uh, one of the biggest things technology is going to do for India and for all of us is to bring inflation down because mm. tech is the biggest deflationary f uh, you know, factor in the world. Mm. The marginal cost of almost everything is coming down to zero. We've seen bandwidth, storage, everything, including energy. I think yeah. slowly and steadily cost is coming mm. down. For India, it's the biggest you know, positive because yeah. India has always been inflationary. We've yeah. always been struggling with this su supply side of our economy. Yes. Tech is going to change that. So I think we need to start getting prepared how do we use this deflationary factor for mm. India's growth and development in a very smart way? But I think even for corporations, we need to adapt to much higher scale and scalability. Mr. Maheshwari. So I think, uh, you know, the sizes of Indian organizations now are pretty global. And we ourselves have now catapulted ourselves into the third global position outside of China globally. I think that opens up far more opportunities for us effectively how do we leverage our size and scale and remain agile. Chuck, I'm going to end with you. So, uh, uh, you know, what is it in terms of the key asks from consumers and customers uh, that you're currently working on? And, you know, what's the priority now that you've set for yourself as well as for the organization, given this for the next few years? You know, look, I think in our organization today and as CEOs, it's no longer enough for us to say we service our shareholders, right? Yeah. We serve our shareholders. We definitely still have to serve our shareholders. But, you know, I'm spending most of my time on the importance of how our culture evolves as an organization, mm. the transparency of communication required by our employees, the, the concern around social dynamics that they care about, social issues in, in, that are going on. So the culture that we're creating is the first thing. I think the second is tied to that which is we have to care as businesses about, you know, call it what you want, our communities, inclusive growth, uh, inclusion of all relative to the expansion that we've seen on a global basis. And uh, because government can't do it alone. Yeah. Uh, so we all have to take much more active roles in participating and making sure that we're putting our assets behind helping make sure that that uh, occurs. Because the, an outcome that isn't aligned with that is a very bad one for the world. And then the third thing I think is we have to, as CEOs, we have to engage with government much more effectively. Mm. We, we have to engage. If you think about what the government is struggling with as they're barraged with all these new technologies. Yeah. And they're trying to, they're trying to actually evolve the regulatory frameworks yeah. against technology that we struggle to keep up with every day. Yeah. And they're politicians, they're government leaders. So I think our job is to also spend time with them to make sure they understand the dynamics and that we're, we're helping them get to healthy regulatory environments mm. that aren't, aren't in our own best interest, mm. but are in the best interest of the country mm. or in the best interest of society. So I think those are some of the big things we have to do. Chuck, uh, Rashesh, Mr. Mahesh Puri, Vikram, and Mr. Gudani, thanks very much for joining us here. Leadership in the era of digital shift, CEO perspective. 